Okay, uh, welcome to Authors at Google, everyone, and welcome to our YouTube viewers as well. Um, I wanted to introduce our guest today, uh, Leila Lalami, who is going to talk about her uh, fiction book, Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits. And uh, just a quick background on Leila. She was born and raised in Morocco. She earned her bachelor's degree in English from the Université Mohamed V uh, in Rabat, her master's degree from University College London, and her doctorate in linguistics from the University of Southern California. Her work has appeared in the Boston Globe, the Los Angeles Times, The Nation, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and elsewhere. She's the recipient of an Oregon Literary Arts Grant, a Fletcher Pratt Fellowship, and a Fulbright Fellowship. Her debut book, uh, which she'll be talking about today, Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, was published in the fall of 2005 and has since been translated in, in, <coughs> excuse me, into Spanish, Dutch, French, Portuguese, and Italian. She was a finalist for the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2006, and she is a Los Angeles resident. Everyone, please welcome Leila Lalami. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really a delight uh, to be here. And thank you, Chris, for that lovely introduction. Um, so as Chris mentioned, I was born and raised uh, in Morocco. And Morocco is one of those places that um, you probably hear about through the travel section of your newspaper that you get online. <laughs> um, so you hear about sandy beaches and deserts and camels and and whatnot, or occasionally you might hear about Morocco through the front page uh, section of your newspaper. So as happened, for example, when um, a group of Moroccans blew up bombs on the Madrid trains in 2004. So between tourism and terrorism, there's a whole <laughs> complex reality that happens. And I was actually, I was born in a very, um, I suppose, very average family. My, um, my, um, my father is an engineer and my mother was a homemaker and um, it was a lower middle class family but my parents really really loved to read. In fact one of my earliest memories is uh, sitting in our living room and having my father in one corner with his book and my mother in the other corner with her book. Uh, my father loved to read um, comic books. He used to love comic books. He read uh, mysteries, uh, crime, adventure novels, some literary fiction. And my mother, on the other hand, loved to read memoirs. That was her thing. I mean, true, true stories. So, so from a very early age, I, I did the same thing. I picked up a book and I started reading. Um, and now this, this was Morocco in the 1970s. So uh, there was very little children's literature available in our native language, which is Arabic. Most of what was available on the marketplace at that time was French, despite the fact that Morocco had been independent by that point for a good 20 years. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I was weaned on Asterix and Obelix and and uh, Tintin and uh, the Three Musketeers and uh, Capitaine Fracas and all these uh, French books when I was a child. So uh, my, my earliest exposures to literature was in this foreign language. Um, and it wasn't until I was about 13 that I came across books written by Moroccans for Moroccans. Um, so I remember very clearly the first time that I read uh, uh, the Shraibi, who just passed away last year, um, Tahar Ben Jaloun, uh, Leila Abu Zaid, and people like that. Um, and at that time, then I started reading um, more adult literature, and, and then it was fine. There was plenty that was available in both languages. But as I said, my earliest exposure was, was really in French. And so I, and even at school, I mean, I received this semi-colonial education. You know, it was drilled into us that you needed to learn French in order to succeed. If you wanted to go and study um, engineering or medicine or any of these uh, technical fields, then you had to really, really be proficient in French because at universities, these topics were taught in French. Um, I think 
so, so, you know, so life went on and, you know, I continued reading and I started writing when I was about uh, nine or ten. Uh, unsurprisingly, I wrote in French and unsurprisingly, the kinds of stories that I wrote might have taken place in France, you know, because of that early exposure. Um, and then I went to, I, I, my first English class was when I was 15, I was in high school and I remember we, we couldn't get over the fact that in English you say, oh, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? And we couldn't understand, what is this isn't it? At the end of the sentence, this tag, and the, it just was, it seemed so exotic and strange. Um, but so I ended up uh, choosing English as my major in college. And then I um, went to, to do a master's in London. And then I came to the United States to uh, go to graduate school. And at that time, I literally became immersed in the English language in a way that obviously school in Morocco hadn't provided, right? So, you know, every moment of every day, I had to use the English language. And so, and even to write my papers for school and all of that. And so when I started trying to go back to writing these stories that I was writing, I found that it was becoming a little bit more difficult. Um, and I, I started to sort of reflect about my choice to write in French and what it really meant. And it was really a realization that, um, that in Sherman Alexie's words, I was in the reservation of my mind. You know, Sherman Alexie has this wonderful phrase that, you know, he had been stuck in the reservation of his mind and then finally the process of writing sort of freed him of that. And in a way, I, f I really felt the same way and, and I started going back over the, the act of writing in French and it just stopped being, um, satisfying. And so I thought, well, I'll try my hand at writing in English since I'm so clearly incapable of writing in literary Arabic. Now, Arabic is a language that um, is in a state of what's called diglossia. There is a high form, which is what you use for newspapers and for literature and for sermons. And then there's the, the vernacular, which is what you actually use every day. And so, of course, I'm, I'm proficient in the vernacular. But as I said, because of the education that I received, my literary Arabic is not very good. So I thought, well, I'll try my hand at writing in English. Um, so I did that, and I found that the process actually has been, um, has been very satisfying, primarily because I feel that it has freed me with, from the, the colonial baggage that inevitably comes with the use of French, at least for me. Um, and it also, in a way, I think, um, gives me some distance with respect to the kinds of stories that I'm writing, particularly since I don't live in Morocco, I live here, and so there is always that risk of writing with nostalgia about one's homeland or one's home country and sort of gloss over certain things, and I feel that writing in English kind of forces me to take a step back, and so there's perhaps a bit more distance, a bit more objectivity in, in, in writing these stories. So this brings me to this book, this is my um, first uh, published book anyway, um, and it's called Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits. And I suppose unsurprisingly for an immigrant, this is a book about immigration. It's about a group of Moroccans who uh, cross the Straits of Gibraltar on a lifeboat. Um, there are four main characters. There is a... Um, young out-of-work mechanic named Aziz. There is a, um, uh, a young mother who wants to run away from her husband and join her brothers in France. Um, there is uh, Fatin, who's a religious student on the run from the law. And lastly, um, there is Murad, who is an unemployed university graduate. And the book essentially starts in, in Medieras, in the middle of the story. We're on the boat with these uh, four main characters as they, as they make this journey from Morocco to Spain. Now, at the narrowest point, the Straits of Gibraltar are only about eight miles wide. I mean, you can, you can stand in, in Tangiers on any clear day and actually see across the Mediterranean to the Spanish side. So Europe is very much this, um, Europe is ever present in people's lives in Tangiers. It's, it's something that, that you can almost touch, but not quite. And um, given all the problems that are facing modern Morocco, particularly unemployment, there's been this wave of, of um, 
there's been a wave of immigration. And, and now that there are all these visas that have been imposed and really tight restrictions on immigration, illegal immigration has taken on larger proportions. In the past, Europe used to welcome having all these workers come, particularly after the Second World War, to rebuild and all of that. Um, so up until you know the, the early 80s, you didn't even need a visa to go to Europe. It was just something that was, a lot of people went and worked in the summer, came back. So that was sort of, that's how things were back then. But then um, by the 80s, Europe decided it had had enough for the most part, so particularly in France. So it, um, it imposed visas, and that's when we saw this wave of illegal immigration. And the characters in this book, like many other people, use uh, boats to cross the Mediterranean uh, to go to Spain and from there to the rest of Europe. So as I said, there are these four main characters, and I'm going to read just from, from the middle of the book as the way that the book, the book is structured is that we start uh, the story on the boat with these characters, but then we have an extended flashback and we get to see, to meet each of these characters individually uh, and get to see their lives before they make the decision to immigrate. And then eventually we flash forward and we get to see who actually made it um, to Spain, who um, realized their dream of immigration and who found just another nightmare waiting for them on the other side. Um, so this is from a piece called Better Luck Tomorrow. So this happens before Murat decides to go uh, to Europe. <clears throat> when the afternoon ferry let out the tourists in Tangier, the guides swooped down on them. They darted from one passenger to the next, offering tours of the medinas and the museums, the palaces and the bazaars. But Murad Idrisi had a different approach. This was his line, interested in pole bowls? And it usually worked, especially with the hippie types. Even though the writer had died a few months ago, Murad could still take the tourists to the houses where he had lived, the cafes he'd gone to, the places where he'd bought his kif. These days, though, the guides outnumbered the tourists, and Murad found little work. He watched carefully as passengers got off the Spanish ferry before he set his sights on a couple. The woman wore a t-shirt and cargo pants. Her companion was in a baseball cap and green shorts. The backpacks they carried gave them a forward leaning gait, but they walked swiftly on the dock. They seemed to be in their late 20s, which wasn't Murad's preferred age range for that line. It usually worked better with older people. Still, he figured they were British or American and would be familiar with bowls and the way things had been lately. He couldn't afford to be picky. They avoided eye contact when he walked up to them, but he recited his line with a suave smile. Interested in pole bowls? A fleeting expression of surprise lit their faces, but they stepped aside. Shit, maybe they weren't American. Hablan espanol, Murad asked. No answer. Another guide slipped between Murad and the tourists. Spresen Sie Deutsch, he asked. Murad shot the guy a look that said, I saw them first, get the hell away from them. The couple walked on, so Murad followed. In the mesh pocket of the woman's backpack, he saw a book. He craned his neck sideways to read the title, Backpacking in Morocco. So he was right, they were probably English. Years ago, when he was still studying for his bachelor's in English, he would go to the American Language Center on Zanqat ibn Mu'az and sit in the library and read all the books he could get his hands on. He loved reading, loved the feel of the paper under his fingers, the way the words rolled off his tongue, how they made him discover things he didn't know about himself. Murad caught up to the couple at the entrance of the ferry terminal. He willed his voice to ring with confidence as he said, my name is Murad. Welcome to Morocco. Would you like to visit Pobos's house? No, thanks, the woman said. An answer at last. There was hope yet. So they weren't interested in bowls. Well, Murad didn't care much for him either. Do you want to see Barbara Hutton's palace? He asked. Who is he talking about? The man asked. From their accent, Murad could tell that they were American, not British, as he'd assumed. The wool were heirs, Jack, the woman said. Murad realized he had misjudged them. They weren't interested in 1960s Tangier, and so he had to think of something else. Taking a cue from their backpacks, he tried again. Want to see the caves of Hercules, Jack? Very, very scenic. Jack turned around so abruptly that Murad bumped into him. Look, 
I'm sorry, he said. We don't need a guide. Thanks anyway. Murad was impressed by how easily they navigated their way amid the crowd of port employees, busy pedestrians, and countless guides and vendors. Now they were already at the light with the bus station and the line of cabs just across the street. Time was running out. He stood next to them, looking them in the eye while they stared straight ahead. I can give you a tour of the Medina, he said. The couple continued ignoring him. Need a hotel room? I know a place where you can get a good price. Still nothing. In desperation, he whispered, you want some hashish? His voice was drowned out by the cars that was by in a cloud of black exhaust. He wasn't sure they had heard him, but when the light changed, there was a slight hesitation in the woman's step. She turned for the first time to look at Murad. Then Jack grabbed her elbow. Eileen, he said. She had a broad forehead and a fair complexion, but it was her clear blue eyes that struck Murad. There was something in them that he recognized. Resignation, perhaps. They were now at the Petit Taxi station. I can get you a good price, Murad said. His voice had a higher pitch than he wanted. His tone pleading, despite himself. He didn't even have any drugs on him. But if they said yes, he could always get a cut from one of the dealers. Jack's hands tightened perceptibly on Eileen's elbow as he guided her to a cab and opened the door for her. Murad took a deep breath. It was over. He turned around and looked toward the dock. He considered going back, but by now all the tourists would be gone. He moved on slowly toward Bab el Bahr, the sea gate, kicking at rocks on the road. The sole of his shoe came loose. Letting out a string of curses, he pressed the ball of his foot harder against the ground to hide the loose rubber. When he passed the Grand Mosque, he heard the muezzin call out for the late afternoon prayer. There would be no more fairies today. So I'm going to skip forward, there's some stuff that happens. Um, and, then, uh, and then this happens. At dusk, Murad headed to the Soko Chico. He took a small detour to avoid walking by the Al-Najat building, where he'd had his only promising interview in the six years since he finished college. It took an extra five minutes, and he had to walk through a narrow street where brown water pooled at a broken sewer but it was better than seeing the employees get off work. He arrived at the Café La Liberté around seven and ordered a cup of coffee. It was thick and tasted like tar. It did nothing for his mood. Around him, turbaned old men smoked unfiltered cigarettes while bareheaded young ones played cards. The TV on the far wall of the café was showing a football match. Real Madrid was playing Barcelona. Murad watched with interest, so he didn't notice Rahal until the man sat down at the table. Rahal smiled at Murad, a smile that looked reptilian because of his large eyes set too far apart and his bald head. Murad nodded but continued watching the match. Rahal ordered mint tea and then poured it, slowly raising the teapot until foam formed in the glass. Then he leaned against the blue tiled wall. Have you thought about our conversation last week? Rahal had been hustling Murad, trying to get him to go on one of those boats to Spain, and Murad had already told him twice that he wasn't interested. The man didn't give up easily. Murad shook his head. I don't think it's a good idea. Rahal played with the sugar cube on his saucer. He turned it around and around between his fingers. Let me ask you something. How much money did you make this month? It's low season right now. Things will pick up in the summer. Rahal smiled. You can't be a guide forever. You'll never make a living on it. Murad took a sip of his coffee and continued watching the match. Great kick, he said, pointing at the screen. Barcelona will win. Rahal didn't look up at the TV. In Spain, he said, someone like you would get a job in no time. I don't know, Murad said. Look, I don't usually talk about this, but I can tell. I can tell right away whether someone's going to make it or not, and you will. You're not like the others. Murad grinned. Did Rahal think he was going to believe that one? Suit yourself, Rahal said. Go play guide. Maybe in 10 years, you'll have saved enough to move out of your mother's house. Murad looked down. In his cup, yellowish foam slowly dissolved in the black coffee. How much, he asked. 20,000 dirhams. Murad shot to his feet. Rahal grabbed his wrist and motioned to him to sit back down. If I get caught, I go to jail, Rahal whispered. Murad huffed at him. How could jail scare Rahal? He dealt drugs in the past, and now he smuggled people to Spain because it was more profitable. Fifteen years ago, Rahal's boss had been a simple fisherman, but now he owned a fleet of these small boats and he'd hired smugglers like Rahal to work for him. 
What about me, Murad asked, his thumb pointed at his chest. You wouldn't go to jail. I don't have 20,000. Well, what about your family? My father is deceased, may God have mercy on him. My mother doesn't have any money. If it weren't for my uncle and my sister, we'd be out on the street. Can't they lend you money? Not that kind of money. It's a very good price, Arhaz said. We've never had any problems. All I can get is 8,000, Murad said, even as he wondered how he was going to convince his uncle and his sister to let him borrow the sum. Ahal chuckled. This isn't some game. We're taking a lot of risk here. He refilled his glass of tea. We have Zodiac lifeboats, not like the pateras the others use. Murad called to mind the sunken fishing boats the Guardia Civil stacked on the Spanish coast, plainly visible from the Moroccan side. They thought it would scare people. It didn't. 10,000, Murad said. Lawa, Lawa, I can't do it for that little. You think 10,000 is little? I don't get all of it. I have to pay for the fuel, don't forget. And then there's the police. I have to grease them. Rahal turned the extra sugar between his fingers. With a swift movement, he put it in his pocket. Let me tell you something. You know Rashid the baker? His brother went on one of our boats about eight months ago. Now he's in Barcelona, and he sends his family money every month. Murad never tired of hearing stories like that. He'd heard the horror stories, too, about the drownings, the arrests, the deportations. But the only stories that were told over and over in the neighborhood were the good stories about the people who'd made it. Last year, Rashid's brother had been just another unemployed youth, a kid who liked to smoke hashish and build weird-looking sculptures with discarded matchboxes, which he then tried to sell off as art. Look at him now. Murad took a deep breath. 12,000. And that's it, he said at last. By God, I won't be able to get any more out of them. Even though Murad talked about them, he knew Lamia wouldn't give him a single real. For one thing, she now had a wedding coming up. For another, he couldn't imagine asking his little sister for help. But it would be different with his uncle. He would talk to him man to man and ask for a loan. Surely the old man wouldn't say no, not after having slighted Murad on the wedding of his sister. If you make it 20,000, I'll get you a job. Guaranteed, like Rashid's brother. Murad sighed. Fine, he said. But listen here. People back out. I don't want to waste my time. I'm not the type to back out. Rahal took a sip. Good. When the time comes, we'll call you. We'll meet on the beach at Babel Oued. When do we leave? When can you get me the money? Murad looked away. Soon, he said. After leaving the Café La Liberté, Murad headed back toward the beach. He found a spot near the Casbah where he could get a view of the Mediterranean. It was getting dark. In the distance, car lights from the Spanish side looked like so many tiny lighthouses, beacons that warned visitors to keep out. He thought about the work visas he'd asked for. For the last several years, the quotas had, been, had filled quickly and he'd been turned down. He knew in his heart that if only he could get a job, he could make it. He would be successful like his sister was today, like his younger brothers would be someday. His mother wouldn't dream of discounting his opinion the way she did. And Spain was so close, just across the straits. He, start, he started walking through the Soko. He saw a few tourists wandering down the market. He couldn't understand these foreigners. They could go to a nice hotel, have a clean bed, go on the beach or the pool. And here they were in the worst part of town, looking around for something exotic. He thought of talking to one or two, asking them if they needed a guide, but his heart wasn't in it anymore. The smell of grilled meat tempted him, and he stopped at a stall that made kifta and brochettes. While he waited for his order, he heard the woman speak in English, and he turned around to look. It was the one from earlier in the day. What was her name? Eileen. She held the guidebook open in one hand and pointed ahead of her with the other. I think it's that way, she said. When she looked up and met his gaze, Murad wondered if she recognized him without his jalaba. She smiled. He saw the ease with which she carried herself, the nonchalance in her demeanor, free from the burden of survival, and he envied her for it. Do you know where the Café Central is? She asked. So he had been right about them after all. They'd come to Tangier looking for the beats. How easy it would be for him to insert himself into their trip now. He could show them the café where Burroughs smoked Keefe or the hotel where he wrote Naked Lunch. But he was past all that now. He was already thinking about his new beginning in a new land. He pointed down the street. This way, he said, across from the Pension Fuentes. Then he turned back to wait for his order. Thank you. Um, so, so that's 
uh, an excerpt from the book. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm not, I mean, I could talk some more, but, but I just figure it'd be much more interesting to have a conversation rather than me lecturing. Yeah. Hi. I was really interested to hear what you were saying about the language that you write in, whether you were writing in French or in English. And I wonder how the other, how the, there's a, you know, a wonderful sort of community of, of North African Francophone writers, and I think especially Vasya Deva from Algeria. <laughs> and just, I wonder how that, how those writers sort of played into your feeling about writing in a colonialized language, or if that community felt like it was accessible or not, or just how that played into that decision? Well, I, I definitely feel like I owe them a debt. I mean, I feel like I owe a debt to, to all the greats, you know, Murud Fir'aun and Tahar Ben Jalloun and Asiya Jabbar and Trish Raibi and, and all of them, because I feel that um, they paved the way. Um, I'm thinking in particular of um, um, Trish Raibi's novel, The Simple Past which was published, I think, in 1954. And so it was literally at the, at the time when Morocco was still like getting its, its, its act together and, and having independence. So it's, um, I feel like I owe them a debt because they made those characters available to someone like me. And if they hadn't paved the way, then it wouldn't have been possible for me to write if they had not been around. Um, or at least to write the kinds of stories that I write today. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, but I think, I mean, somebody like Asiya Jabbar, for example, who's now a member of the uh, Académie Française, you know, um, she, she has said many times that, that it, it was not possible for her to write in either Berber or Arabic because she had gone to French schools. I mean, she grew up under the occupation. So for her, using the French language in order to write these stories is a way of sort of talking back to the empire. This is sort of what Salman Rushdie talks about when he says that the empire writes back. Um, it's, it's, um, it's essentially um, saying that you're not going to be silent, even if you have to use the other language in order to be able to, to write. But that's not to say that there, that there isn't a rich literature. Like, for example, Leila Abu Zaid, um, who writes in Arabic, has always made the choice that she was going to write in Arabic, no matter what. Um, she definitely has a role to play. And I'm, I'm happy to report that now she's being taught in, in school. So like all high schools in Morocco, uh, uh, for example, read her, her autobiography. It's one book that they've assigned. Um, so I, I definitely feel like I owe a debt to all those who came before. And, but I think, that, I think that the kind of stories that I'm writing is um, there are a lot of other Moroccan writers who are also um, sort of using the languages of the, of the countries in which they live in order to write. So in Morocco, because as I mentioned before, there's a huge wave of immigration, uh, both legal and illegal. And Morocco is a country that, that has about 30 million people, and yet we have 3 million immigrants. I mean, 3 million people who live outside of Morocco. So this is a very huge diaspora community. Um, and uh, what's happened over the course of the last maybe 20 years is there's been really a development of a Moroccan literature in all these other languages. Um, for example, there's uh, Abdul Qadir bin Ali, who's, uh, who's Dutch, but he, so he writes in Dutch, but his stories are often set in Morocco or among the Moroccan community in the Netherlands. Um, so there are a lot of other people who are doing the same thing, Italian, Spanish, French, obviously. So. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you structured the book and how you came to sort of uh, format it as a set of linked stories? Sure, sure. Well, this book actually started as a short story. Uh, and it literally was about this character, Murad. That's why I often like to read this, you know, his, his chapters. Because the book started as a short story about a young man, um, sort of like a male version of myself, really. Um, he's he's, an, he's a, a, a graduate with an English degree, but he can't find a job. He lives in Tangier. And so the idea sort of and germinates in his mind that he's going to, to give immigration a try. Since everybody else seems to be trying it, he's going to try it. He's a bit naive in that way. And, and so the story was just about him making that crossing, but it started to have all these long flashbacks. And I started to wonder, why is it that I'm having all these flashbacks in, in a story that's about the actual act of immigration? Um, 
And so I decided to take all of those flashbacks out of the story and just put them in a separate story. And it could be just two stories about one individual at two different points in his life. So that's how it started. But then, you know, I just started working on it and revising them. And I thought, wait a minute, what about the other people who are sitting next to him? Wouldn't it be kind of cool to know what happened to, to each one of them? So I did all of these. And I had like something like 10 characters, like each one on the boat. So it was going to be kind of tied, like all the people who leave and why they're leaving. Um, but then I, I kept revising this for about a year. I realized that it was going to be a kind of a linked uh, collection of stories. But I felt very unsatisfied. And it took me a while to realize why. And that's because I didn't have uh, closure with each of the characters. And so I thought, you know, I really need to know what's going to happen. So I decided to just focus on the, on the four characters that seemed the most interesting to me and then find out what happened to them. And I did this literally without any a priori. Like I had no idea. I didn't set out to say, OK, this one's going to you know, make it, and this one's it was not going to make it. I just literally picked up the story from wherever I left it and followed the thread and, and saw whether, whether they were going to make it or not, if you will. And I thought when I was done, I, I, I ended up with this structure where we, you open in the middle of the action, and then you go back, and then you go forward to kind of complete, to give it a full circle. And I tried to, to, to understand why that was. And I, I feel like maybe it's because I'm an immigrant myself, and I feel that uh, too much of immigrant literature focuses on a narrative of arrival, so the process of coming back, particularly in the United States. So it's the process of coming to this country and struggling and you know, making it and you know, the American dream and all of that. And I feel like there isn't enough focus about all, uh, the, all the things that people leave behind, which you know, are not, you, know, you have to live with this. You know, immigration is something that sort of splits your life into a before and after. And I, I, you know, it just, um, I just felt like I wanted to pay homage to that, to all the things that we do leave behind and all the people that we do leave behind. So I, I wanted to have a narrative of departure and a narrative of arrival. And kind of, and the fact that, that, that it started with this, it, it's, it's almost, um, to me, it just, it's, it works well because most of the time when these Moroccan immigrants are heard about, they're heard about in these headlines about, uh, you boats you know, uh, you know, capsizing or all these horrible accidents in the Coast Guard. So that's really the headline in them. But then there's all the stories that lay beneath the surface. And I thought that was interesting exploring it that way. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a story that gets a lot of strong reactions from a lot from very different people. It's been kind of amusing to me to watch people's um, how people interpret that story and how their interpretations are obviously not my interpretations, but that's just how the world is. That's the beauty of books, which I think is really unique to books and, and probably not something that other art forms uh, share. So, for example, if you have a painting, well, that's the painting. We all can see the colors in it. We all can see what it represents, and we can discuss what it, what the, the different interpretations. But we can agree what it about what it looks like. But you know, with 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 books, you know, each one of us is creating images in his or her own mind, and these images are highly individualistic, and we bring our own experiences into the book in trying to interpret it. So there are as many books as there are readers, really, for this particular book, anyway. So with this story of the, of the fanatic, it's, um, I mean, I, I, I wrote it because it was something that, that I'm, I'm deeply interested in. Uh, I grew up, as I said, I was, I'm a child of the 70s. So I mean, I grew up in Morocco at a time when like, covering was just sort of seen as this really odd thing for somebody our age. It was something that your grandmother did. You know, it wasn't something that your mother did even, you know, or that you would do. Um, and then something happened when I was in high school, and we started seeing girls showing up in school covering. And I remember the first time actually it happened, the girl got sent back home because it was that unusual. Um, and so in, in, and in short order, it became a phenomenon. And, and so to me, you know, the headscarf is just something, or the veil as it's incorrectly called, it's just something that 
that um, it's very complex. It's not just because people do it because they, they have a religious, um, a feeling that it's a, a religious mandate, although that's certainly part of it. But there are many different reasons why people uh, or women choose to cover. Um, among them, you know, making a political statement uh, or, you know, sometimes people do it for economic reasons. Uh, because they're poor and it's much uh, cheaper to, to wear that traditional religious garb than to wear um, Western clothes. Sometimes people do it because of peer pressure. I remember reading a story about a woman who was teaching at a small school and all the other female teachers had covered and she was the only one who didn't cover and she got, you know, like a, a headscarf in her mailbox and that kind of, you know, um, uh, pressure. So there's there's a variety of reasons for why people cover. But the fact is is that there there definitely has been a rise in this um, these obvious symbols of religious affiliation. And I was interested in 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 exploring that. It's just it's it's a, it's an in, infinitely complex subject, and I just wanted to to take a look at it. So in this story, there's a young a university student who is from a very modest background who covers. And there is a girl who is from sort of the upper middle class, like, you know, and, and has no interests in religion or anything. And they kind of meet. And the, 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 um, the sort of liberal girl decides to cover, too. And her father just uh, <laughs> loses it. And um, so it's a story that explores why we do the kinds of things that, that we do. Um, but to me, it's also a story about hypocrisy. It's a story that simply asks you whether you truly believe that whether or not you cover means that you are better or worse. Like, so for example, the the the, the girl who 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 initially doesn't cover, like, you know, her father doesn't want her to cover because he doesn't want her to be associated with the others. He doesn't want her to be part of that of the sort of the lower middle classes. You see, he's an upper middle class man, and his daughter is going to go study in America. And so you know, it's just unseemly for his daughter to, to cover and to, to, to sort of um, to show her affiliations in that way, in her religious affiliations. And it's a story that asks, you know, who is really, you know, a lot of people really identify with the father because he's sort of, um, he's not practicing and, you know, he doesn't want his daughter to cover, which seems on the surface of it to be, oh, this is a very modern man and, you know, more power to him. But a lot of people miss that in the story, he's, the, he's a guy who's very corrupt. He takes bribes, he does, you know, he flunks people. I mean, he does some pretty horrible things. But a lot of people identify with him because they're so terrified of this of, of the headscarf that they want to be on the side of the guy who's against it. So it's just it's 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 just very, it's just very complex. I think it's a story about hypocrisy and basically asking ourselves, you know, um, what it really means when it, when a person um, chooses to cover and how that affects us, whether it's any of our business in, at the end of the day, you know. So. <laughs> So it, I mean, I, I remember I had uh, this this woman read my story, and she's like, "I don't understand, you know." So this is a metaphor for the West and the Arab world. So the West is the modern father, and the and the Arab world is that girl who covers. And so why did you have to make the, the why did you have to make him the corrupt one? Is the simplistic reading that you know, like because he's this sort of modern man, he can't possibly have any like. You know, he has to be absolutely perfect so we can all the better to create a contrast with all those, you know, backward people and all that, which is ridiculous. You know, I mean, there's, to me, there's, um, there's a lot of good in what uh, the, the, the Fatin says. It's just that she carries it to a level where she really wants everybody else to be like her. And that's when I, that's when I get off the bus. I, you know, I, I'm, I just feel like, you know, it's, it's her body. She can do with it whatever she wants just as long as she leaves me out of it, so. That's my opinion, but that's not how everybody, you know, interprets. Everybody interprets that story differently. So, <laughs> anything else? Yeah. So, um, I mean, these characters are fascinating, and I'm just wondering, do you do you sort of consider um, like where their stories sort of go from here? Like, you know, I mean, you sort of like lay it out where you thought it's like basically going to be this one huge, uh, you know, little play about. Right. And I mean, I'm, is there is there a story? I mean, I, I know there's a story left here, but is, is that something that you're interested in? Sort of well, you know, it, it's funny because several people have asked me that. I think. Um, you know, the funny thing is that even though the book came out in 2005, and you know, I've been talking about it since then, I still, I really do still think about these characters and what's 
going to happen to them, and I wouldn't rule out um, writing more uh, stories with them. Um, so yeah, it's it's entirely possible. Entirely possible. Right now, I'm working on a novel that's occupied me for the last you know several years. So when that's done, maybe I can go back to this. So, yeah. yeah. Can you talk about Oh, about the next novel. Well, I can't because it's just it's almost done. So I'm I'm really excited. I can't wait to start um, sharing it with readers. So it's called The Outsider. And it's about another young man. It's about a young man who uh, grows up in a slum in Casablanca. And his entire life, he thinks that his father is, um, is dead. And then at the beginning of the novel, he discovers that his father is, is very much alive. He's a wealthy man living on the other side of town. So the, the, the sort of the opening is sort of melodramatic on purpose, because the whole point of the book, I think, is it explores, um, it explores the idea of truth and um, and how that's different from facts. Um, it explores religious fundamentalism. It explores uh, the political situation in Morocco and the, sort of the choices that are really available to this man. You know, I was trying to come up with like a nifty little, um, like, short description for it, but it's just it's still it's still with me now. So I guess the best way that I could describe it is that it's uh, it's about the Arab street. You know how Thomas Friedman, you know, every, every few weeks he loves to talk about what the Arab street thinks because he's so well informed. And so the, 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 the book is about, you know, the actual, <laughs> an actual character from the Arab street and what he goes through and, and what life is like for him and, and the choices he has to make um, at the end of the book. So, yeah. How long did you spend writing the book and revising? Oh, yeah, sure. The, uh, let's see. I started writing this, trying to think. It was published in 2005. It was fo sold in 2004. And I think I wrote it the entire time between 2000 and like the first, 2001, the end of 2001. I know I start. yeah, so it's the end of 2001. I started writing it, most of 2002 and 2003. And then I was still revising it before it went to the printer, so yeah. So it took maybe two and a half years for this one. And the one that I'm working on right now, it's, it's four and a half years. It's, um, it's kind of a bigger book. Um, and as far as the, the process of publication, this was really interesting because I, I honestly didn't know what to expect. I, I, didn't, I felt like I was writing a story. I didn't know if I could find even a publisher that was interested in, in the story. It's not even set in the United States. It's, you know, so, and, and the publishing industry does tend to be a little bit sort of um, turned inward. Uh, um, so, but it, it, it was a pretty smooth process. I, I found an agent in 2004, and she took the book, and it sold like in two weeks. So it was, it was a pretty uh, simple process um, overall. The publishing it. And I, even when it came out, I didn't know what to expect as far as the reception that it would get. But it has really been embraced by, by critics. And what, what, um, what has been wonderful about it is that it's been embraced by the Moroccan community. So that, that's kind of a neat thing. So, yeah. Yes? You spoke a little bit that um, the way you timed the book and the sort of the past and the present and the future was sort of a way to a different take on the integration novel. So you seem very aware that you were writing a, a, an integration novel and a book about the movie. And I was wondering if you thought about it more in that sense more than you did about the characters, were there things mm. you were trying to convey about mm. about integration in general mm. as opposed to just the characters? That's an interesting question. Well, I mean, as I said, it started with this character of, of Murad. That's who I had to guide me through this story. And I, you know, he is an immigrant. That's what he is. And so writing, writing that character, immigration is a big part of his life. But I also wrote, so that's how it started with him. But like writing about his life before and his life after just gave me a, a sort of way to explore the entire character. And immigration is by no means the only sort of um, 
uh, the only theme in this book because there's a lot of, it's essentially a book about modern Morocco. So if, if you've been to Morocco, you know that like immigration is something that you will see every single day in one form or another um, in that society. So for example, it could just be something as simple as if it's in the summer, you can see on the freeway literally caravans of cars coming back from Europe um, because people are coming back for the summer for vacation. So the traffic is horrible and on the freeway because everybody's coming back. Uh, and then in September, everybody's going back. <laughs> um, it could be, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but it really, it's, it's just very much a part of our culture now. It's part of our life. So it's, it's, I just don't think it's possible to write a novel about modern Morocco that doesn't feature immigration. But there's a lot of other things that are going on in the book. And I think that's, um, in a way, it's just a book about modern Morocco more than it is about other things. So. But yeah, I mean, at the beginning, it has to start with the characters. Otherwise, you know, I could just write a nonfiction book. But, but um, the character is what guided me through this because I was interested in him. And I, I just, I, I cared so deeply about him. In a way, I care, I almost feel like I care too much because then, you, you know, if you, it's kind of like having a kid where you want to protect them. And, you know, they're characters. You've got to let them do stuff. If you, if you protect them too much, then they don't really go through life experiences. And so in a way, it's, I always have to fight that, like, but suffering from too much empathy, not, not lack of empathy. So. Okay. <laughs> There's no more questions, but thank you very much. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you.